Hello everyone, Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching. I have another Monday quarterback video for you. I'm going to play this video and talk about things that are going on that are claiming what's going on and talk about things that I think that are being done right and are done wrong. Here we go. This following critical incident briefing is intended. And we'll skip the beginning. Event for all always a couple of minutes. Angeles, of Angeles County Fire. And analyze. Acts or no. Or use it can be graphic and difficult to watch. Viewer discretion is advised. On Thursday, November 11, 2021, at approximately 9.48 p.m., deputies assigned to East Los Angeles Sheriff Station responded to a call regarding a male and female who reported being followed by seven to eight vehicles and having an unknown person point a gun at them at a gas station. The gas station is located in the 5700 block of Whittier Boulevard in the City of Commerce. Patrol deputies responded, but were unable to locate the callers or any suspicious vehicles in the area. The callers were later determined to be Franklin Moran, a 25-year-old male, and Wendy Flores de Roque, a 40-year-old female. Several hours later, on November 12, 2021, at approximately 2.59 a.m., a deputy responded to a second call for service at the same gas station where Flores de Roque once again reported vehicles were following them. The deputy arrived and contacted Moran and Flores de Roque, who were seated in a parked gold Chevrolet Tahoe. Moran refused to provide his name, but did confirm they did not call the police and they had not seen anyone with a gun. After he was unable to confirm the information on the call, the deputy proceeded to drive away from the area. Almost one hour later, at 3.52 a.m., East Los Angeles Sheriff's Station desk personnel received a 911 call regarding a suspicious person at the same gas station. The caller reported a male was lighting fires at the gas pumps. 911, what is your emergency? I work at, at the gas station. There's a guy lighting fires next to the pump. What is the he has on his hand? He has like paper and like a gas tank and he's lighting fires and he's throwing it at the tank. That's a death sentence. Can I have a description of this uh, person, please? Is he Hispanic, he black. black, white, or Asian? He looks white. How old? He looks old, like 27. What is he wearing, ma'am? He's wearing a black beanie, uh, oversized hoodie, a gray hoodie, and some black sweatpants, and some brown shoes. So he's lighting a paper and throwing it at the gas pumps? Yeah, he has like a, I don't know, I think he pulled on the hose and he lit the fire next to the hose. Actually, he's Hispanic. He got closer to the gas station and he's arguing with some guy. What's on your priority? No, I'm not talking to the dispatcher. Okay, um... Okay, what uh, what gas pump number is he next to? Well, actually, he's right next to a gas station right now. Like, right in front of where I'm at. In front of what? Like, right in front of the window where I'm at. Okay. All right, just stay on the line with her, okay? And fill the line with me, okay? And what is your name, ma'am? Just keep an eye on her. 
Have you seen him before? Or? Yeah, he used to come like a while ago. He used to be like a regular, but I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with him, but he said, he's telling me that they're trying to kill him, and he came up to the window and he started talking to me because she recognized him. Okay, is he, is he by chance on a uh, shabby doll? Yeah. Is the shabby doll still right there, ma'am? Yeah, it's like right in front of the gas station. And how, where's the female? Because there's supposed to be a female. Yeah, there's a female with the, with the striped sweater. And is she inside the, the, the tunnel? Yeah. Yeah, and the guy who was lighting the fire was just like right in front of me. Like right okay. outside the window. Okay, hold on a second. I'm going to read it to 44. Even the female, the one that does the husband, I think. The 1935, and the towel is still there. Are they high? Yes, uh huh. And then she called again, and after that, he called, and now she's doing this. Uh, mm. Just keep an eye on them, ma'am, okay? Okay. The same deputy from the previous call arrived within minutes and contacted Moran and Flores de Roque. The couple were standing next to a parked Chevrolet Tahoe in the southwest corner of the gas station. The deputy ordered Moran to walk to his patrol car and place his hands on the hood of his patrol car. Moran did not comply. Instead, he remained standing near the parked Tahoe and placed his hands on the top of his head. As the deputy approached Moran, Flores de Roque remained standing next to the open driver's door of the Tahoe. The deputy took hold of Moran's hands and Moran instantly spun around and grabbed onto the deputy's holstered duty weapon with both hands. The deputy struggled to keep his gun in his holster as Moran attempted to remove it. As this was occurring, Flores de Roque retrieved the knife and attempted to stab the deputy. The deputy fell backwards and landed on his back. Flores de Roque continued to swing the knife at the deputy, striking him in the face while Moran continued to attempt to remove the deputy's duty weapon from the holster. The deputy retrieved his backup gun from another pocket, and a deputy-involved shooting occurred. Hmm. Put your hands on my hood. Take your hand in your pockets, dude. Come back and walk over here. Come over here. Come walk right here. Come walk over here. Put your hands on my on my hood. Dude, get over here. Come here. Keep your hands on your head. Fucking magnetic mounts for these cameras suck ass. Um, and this is what happens when you get a magnetic mount for the body camera. The tiniest bit of struggle and the motherfucker goes flying off. a screaming lady in the background. <laughs> that was a screaming dude.
maybe he identifies as a lady. <laughs> So back that up. Um, so you can hear in the background another officer saying, hey, what do you got? And um, that officer who's attacked starts going into basically detail, almost detail of, of what happened. Um, all, really all he needs to say is both these people need to be handcuffed right now. Uh, and that's all that needs to be said. Or he could say, these two tried to kill me. They're under arrest. Like, there's no need to go into, oh, this guy, he, he crawled on top of me and was trying to take my gun, and then she over here, she had a knife, and then she came over here and tried to stab me, and then I had to pull this gun out, and then she, like, fuck that. That's too much fuck. One, that's too much talking to begin with. Um, it's not clear, concise communications. Uh, it's lengthy. All you need to say is, these two tried to kill me. They're under arrest. Secondly... This is a use of force incident. You don't want to start talking and giving statements after a use of force situation because you are under the influence of a drug called adrenaline. You are under the quote-unquote influence of fight-or-flight syndrome. Your body has experienced some um, psychological and physiological changes immediately too like rapidly you can experience things like tunnel vision auditory exclusion you can have uh, time distortion uh, I forget the damn name for it um, you can have time the sense of time can go super slow for some people and go super fast for some people. Some people swear up and down that they, when they fired, they could track the fucking bullet coming out of their gun and hitting the person. Or they could see the bullet flying through the air. I, I don't know. Uh, but some people, that, that's what they report. Uh, the auditory exclusion. Some people report that they don't even hear their gun firing and they think that there's something wrong with their gun. Um, you... The details, the the sequence of events beca can become a little bit garbled under all that stress. You may um, get some of the steps mixed up. One may become before the other. You may completely forget about something, etc. Um, that's a that's typical under fight fight or stress flight. I can't talk fight or flight stress uh, stimuli, and is. Part of what happens to the brain during traumatic events. That's what happens to a person involved in trauma. So the best thing to do is go through two sleep cycles, wait over you know 24 hours before making any statements. That way your brain can relax and process what has gone on, which is crucial because if you start making statements immediately after the deadly force encounter, then because of those things that can occur to you, you, and you not uh, very accurately be able to say event 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 in order, and you put you know, 6 before 
five and seven before, you know, four, then that is a statement. And what you say can be used against you. And then two days later, when you go do the walkthrough or you do another statement and you are remembering it better and then you give a statement, it's not going to match up with the first statement that you gave. And then the the other party is going to use that. Like, look, this is what he said at first, and now he's saying this. This guy's a fucking liar. So you never want to make big statements like that after a self-defense shooting. Um, there is a page on YouTube called uh, Armed Attorneys, I think it's called. Let me take a quick look i think it's called armed attorneys and it's been something that i've been watching for uh last couple weeks i guess you could say and uh, i like the content yeah it's called armed attorneys it's on youtube i highly recommend going and checking it out um they kind of talk about some pretty good stuff um also you know you should all you should already be reading and listening to some stuff from lieutenant colonel dave grossman now, some people say they don't really like him, and, you know, some of the stuff that he's written about is debunked, whatever. Uh, but what he talks about, you know, what happens, fight or flight, you know, all that, that's pretty damn accurate. Um, and you need to get that information. Um, and know that in a self-defense shooting situation, you should not be making lengthy statements right after the fact. You need to wait at least a couple of sleep cycles and then give the statement. It'll be better for you when it comes to the legal fight. There's three fights, right? You got the physical fight for your life. Then after that comes the mental fight and the legal fight. The mental fight, you having to deal with the fact that you killed someone um, and then dealing with uh, with, you know, the fact that people could be looking at you differently, like, oh, that guy, he's killed someone. Ooh, oh my God, he's different now. Um, it could end up being a high-profile thing, and or, you know, people have something negative to say about it, and you go out in public. No one recognizes you realistically, but uh, you may be feeling that mark of Cain on you or whatever, and, and just having a lot of anxiety going out. Um, and then the legal fight, you're going to have to answer for what you've done. Um, the act in and of itself without legal justifications to it is a crime. It has to be investigated. Your claim for self-defense has to be investigated. It has to be proven. So you have a legal fight to go through. It can be short. It can be long. Depends on the circumstances. But don't make any statements right after the fucking fight. Moran and Flores de Roque were both struck by gunfire. Additional deputies arrived on scene and provided medical aid to Moran and Flores de Roque until the arrival of Los Angeles County Fire Department paramedics, who continued life-saving efforts. Paramedics pronounced Flores de Roque dead at the scene. Moran was transported by ambulance to a nearby hospital where he was treated for non-life-threatening injuries and medically cleared for booking. The deputy was transported to a nearby hospital where he received medical treatment for a laceration and traumatic injury to his face. There were no other persons injured during this incident. A folding knife approximately 9 inches in length was recovered at the scene. Neither Moran nor Flores de Roque had any known criminal history. Subsequent to this incident, Moran was charged with murder, arson, and resisting arrest. 
The Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department has begun a thorough and in-depth investigation. Homicide investigators will continue to investigate this incident, which may include completing additional interviews, examining additional evidence and toxicology results, if applicable, and completing forensic reviews of the involved evidence. When the previous call arrived within minutes and contacted Moran and Flores de Roque, the couple were standing next to a parked Chevrolet Tahoe in the southwest corner. He struggled to keep his gun in his holster, the driver's door of the Tahoe. The deputy took hold of Moran's hands, and Moran instant. So, with this type of call, there should have been a second person there. Now, there may have been a second person en route to this location, but there should have for sure been a second person there. Uh, if that means that you need to uh, wait before pulling on scene, then fucking do that. Especially with, with this, this kind of thing where they're trying to set fire to shit. And there's two of them. For sure, uh, a rifle needs to be taken out on this. If you're trying to set fire to a gas station, that's likely going to cause serious physical injury and or death to people, especially if there's an explosion. They could be wanting to try and blow the place up and kill people. Whatever it is their intentions are, um, it can result in people dying. And so it is a deadly force scenario. So for sure, I think rifle needs to be brought out on something like this. Um, as far as going into the, the physical defensive tactic stuff, uh, it's kind of hard to verbally explain some things without good visuals. Um, of course, you know, a person doing a gun grab... Um, before they ever go grab for the gun, they can sometimes telegraph what they're going to be doing by simply looking at the gun. Um, there is possibility that um, this guy exhibited some of those behaviors. He was eyeballing the gun, um, had those other physical traits going on, and the officer may have missed it. I don't, I don't know. You can't see very well in the camera footage. Um, dude goes for the gun. And that in itself, that's that's deadly force right there. Like, for sure, deadly force. Like, why is the person trying to take your gun? Are they really interested in reading what's on the side of it? No. They're wanting to use it. That's the only fucking reason why they're wanting to get it out. Um, lots of cops have had their guns taken away from them, and they've been killed with their own gun. So over the years, uh, holster designs have improved and security retention holsters make it difficult for someone to get the gun out. It makes it where it's a slower process for them to do it because they have to figure out how to unlock the damn thing. For the user, you know how your holster works. You can easily pull the gun out even when it's a level three holster. For someone else, it can be harder for them to get it get it out. But they can get it out. It just slows them down. Um, the uh, techniques for you know securing the gun in the holster, someone trying to go for it, you know, pushing down on their hand. Uh, other training has shown the to reach to the bottom of the holster and pull up and pin the gun in their hand against your side. Uh, there are some techniques and and setups to where. A person will carry a fixed blade knife on their non-dominant side, like a little knife either to the side of their magazine pouch, behind their magazine pouch, and the idea is your right hand goes down, you pin that person's hand down on top of the holster, top of the gun, push down, keep them from pulling it out, or you can do the grab the bottom of the holster and pull up, flex it, turn it sideways, and have basically the gun pressing into your side and pinning their hand in, and then taking that knife pulling it out and either a fucking stabbing them with it if you have the dagger style uh start stabbing them in the the neck face chest whatever uh or you know if it's uh more of a uh, knife style like a, a k-bar or tdi you can reach across and you can cut their fucking forearm and their wrist super deep cut the tendons and they can no longer start grabbing with that hand uh and then if you need to you can start poking them with it and punching holes in them with that knife until they get the fuck off of you. And then 
you can draw your gun and point it at them. Um, the fact that he has two assailants on him, that makes it extremely difficult. And that is where some, uh, you know, other hand-to-hand -hand stuff can come into play. But like I said, it can be very difficult to try and explain those things, how to, you know, get out of the mount and, uh, you know, shrimp out, stuff like that. It's, it's you know... I'd, I'd have to like set up a camera and have someone else here with me and, and demonstrate that stuff. And that's just not logistically possible right now. Um, but there is some other, you know, so there is some more that could be said about hand to hand stuff. Um, one, I just can't do it any justice cause I, I don't have any visuals and, and stuff to be able to show. Uh, and two, the hand to hand stuff, although I've trained for it, it's not something that I teach. So I don't think that I could give it any justice in trying to, really go any further and verbally explain anything but there is things that that can be done um and this that's that's a scary fucking thing to think about like one dude grab a hold of your gun you can't get that damn gun out and then you're on the ground on your back and now someone comes up with a fucking knife you can't take your hands off your gun very well or at least one hand off the gun because the dude could get it out now you're fighting him and now this other person's coming up with a knife and you gotta use one hand to try and deflect uh, they said that he pulled a backup gun out of another pocket. I don't know what that means. I don't know if he had an actual backup gun in his pant pocket. Or um, he was able to have a backup gun within his uniform uh, vest under his shirt. There are some designs where you can have um, a backup gun on your uh, vest under your shirt and most uniform shirts are zippered so you can unzip it reach in grab it pull it out and use it um i would really like more information on where his backup gun was uh unfortunately just don't, they don't offer it uh, but it was in a place where he could reach it and get it out and put it into play uh which is probably what has saved his life um had he not had and I don't even know for sure if he did it with his non-dominant hand. He, he could have got it out with his dominant hand, maybe. I, I don't know. Um, but let's say he did not have a backup gun that he could have easily accessed like that. What else could he have done? Uh, for one, uh, depending on how he has his taser placed, uh, he could have used his other hand to pull the taser out and just shot the fucking probes right into this dude's fucking head. Shoot it right into the side of his goddamn head. Put one probe through his fucking ear. Um, that would definitely fuck that dude's world up. Um, of course, Taser, you know, the standard training is you should not shoot someone in the head with a Taser. You should not shoot someone in the groin with a Taser. Uh, unless it's a deadly force kind of thing. And this is a deadly force kind of thing. So, yeah, for sure. He could have shot that dude right in the side of the head. Uh, with his taser device and he, he, you're not going to achieve NMI with two probes close together but fucking two probes in your head like, I, I don't know what that feels like I've been tased a few times for training and the probes have been above and below the belt and high in the back and low in the back and I've had one from I had the probes um, from the belt going down to the leg just having it go through your body and feeling that that's one thing. I can imagine what it would be like having probes stuck in your head and that damn thing cycling. Like that's <laughs> that's kind of uh, like that's got to fucking hurt. Uh, that would for sure stop that dude from trying to do anything else for at least for a good five seconds. Um, and that could buy enough time to move his hands out of the way, get your primary gun out. If she's slashing, and stabbing, reach up shoot her, and then, or, start with him, pull the gun out, put the gun to his head, give him two close contact hits, move up, and then shoot her. Um, OC, I mean, that's an option, too. If he couldn't get his primary gun out, you know, he could have still pulled OC out, sprayed up at her. You know, the, the risk with that OC is it could splatter and come back down on him, and now he's being affected by it. Uh, but, you know, that could have been something that could have changed the outcome in that uh, had he not been able to access his backup gun. Um, 
So backup gun placement, um, a lot of people carry a backup gun on their on their ankle. Um, that can be a decent place to get to it, or um, that can be a decent place to carry it, but is it something that you can easily access in a scenario like this? Uh, this one, I, I don't think so, but other scenarios where you could end up on the ground, you could get to your ankle gun kind of easily. Um, other ways, like I said, I mentioned is the, the vest. There's a special holster that can attach to a concealed vest. Um, other than that, um, I have seen some people do kind of a, a tucked gun kind of behind the duty belt, um, under the shirt. It's not the, I don't think that's the greatest way to do it. Um, I think the two best options are the vest or the ankle. Um, you're kind of limited on placement of the backup gun because you don't want the backup gun being easily accessible to other people and easily visible to other people so they know that it's there. Um, but you also want it to where you can access it. Um, and there's really not a whole lot of options when it comes to that. As far as the background on these people, um, I, I don't know. I don't know anything else about them. Uh, they sound like they're batshit fucking crazy. Um, and it's unfortunate that uh, one of them survived. It would have been better if both of them would have expired, in my opinion. Um, it's sad to think, but this dude is probably not going to be spending a whole lot of time in prison. Probably not. Um, he will probably be out a lot sooner than what you think. It's California. Their criminal justice system is severely fucked. Um, would not be surprised if within 10 years he's walking the streets after trying to kill a police officer. That's the problem where we're at in society. I also would not be surprised to find out if these two were probably out on bond or out on probation or on parole, would not be surprised at all to find that out. Um, unfortunately, that seems to be a recurring thing. Uh, violent offenders getting out early, not spending a whole lot of time being locked up. And then they get out and they reoffend and victimize more people. It is a huge miscarriage of justice and we need justice reform in this country. Not the way the left wants it, not at all, because uh, the left wants no prisons, they want no jails, they want treatment instead of jail. Uh, the reform that we need is we need to get hard on crime. We need to get hard on criminals and make criminals fear the criminal justice system again. We need to lock away violent offenders and persistent felony offenders for a long time. Long, long time. Forever? is the best option or for an incredibly long amount of time to where when it's time to release them, they're old, they're old people and they're not going to be a threat because they're so fucking old. Go anywhere in this country and you come across a vicious dog that attacks people. One of two things is going to happen. One option is the court may order that that dog be kenneled for the rest of its life. It's going to have to live in a kennel. It can't be roaming the front yard or backyard. You can't put a leash on it and take it out. Uh, if you do have to move it from the kennel to um, veterinarian and stuff like that, you know they're going to mandate that that damn thing has a muzzle, uh, etc. You, like, your dog is vicious and it attacks people, and they say kennel, that's, that's where it stays. It cannot go anywhere else. Um, or the second option is to destroy it, euthanize Asian. Um, because we recognize that a vicious dog cannot be rehabilitated. You can't do it. You're not going to take a vicious dog and be like, all right, Rover, you bit this kid, we're going to lock you up. 
for 12 months in the dog pound. Hard time. Ruff. Then we're going to let you go. And you're going to be a good boy because we locked you up for 12 months. No. Rover is not going to be a good boy after 12 months. Rover is still going to be a vicious fucking dog. That's why we get two options. For humans who are vicious, it's like we've lost that concept. Like, huh. Well, this guy who has fucking shot people, has done all this other shit, we'll lock them up for three years around other people that they're friends with and are like, and they'll have a bunch of behavioral problems while they're locked up. But at the end of that three years, we'll let them out and they'll be rehabilitated. They'll be a new man. They won't go out and hurt anybody anymore. No. And it'll work. Does not work. Violent offenders cannot be rehabilitated. Just can't. That's why we will never let people out like Ted Bundy or uh, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. We know for sure we cannot let those people out. But when it comes to these other killers, just because they haven't killed enough people, they mo- a lot of them have tried to kill a lot of people. Medical, medical, modern medical technology um, has prevented them from dying. That and, and that realistically is the only thing that fucking keeps a lot of people from staying in prison for a long time is because there is a really good medic who is good at their job or there's a really good doctor. If it weren't for that, the person they tried to kill would have died and they'd be getting a murder charge instead of attempted murder or aggravated assault. Which is wrong. But people like this, they can't be rehabilitated. So, we should have those two options when it comes to vicious people. If you like what you hear and see, go ahead and give me a like and a share. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and stay tuned for more Monday Quarterback videos. Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense, thank you for watching.